welcome everybody to the North of Tyne Combined Authority Formal Cabinet Meeting and welcome in particular to uh, Nick Camp, who's joined the Cabinet from Newcastle and to Alex Hay who's uh, standing for Councillor Kilgour today. And Sorry, that's a handwriting issue. <laughs> um, so, um, we have only one apology for absence, and that's, that's Karen, um, as I said, and Alex is standing in for it. Um, are there any declarations of interest that haven't yet been um, declared on people's forms? I'll take it as not. No, thank you. Okay, minutes of the previous meeting. Um, is everybody comfortable with them? Just a few nods. Yeah, thank you. And let's move on then. So today being the AGM, there is a lot of procedural business um, as opposed to the really exciting stuff of how we're making life better for people. But this is an important part of democracy and it has to be done. So I'll hand straight over to John Softly, the monitoring officer, who's going to run through the um, various appointments of the various committees. Okay. Thank you, Chair. As you say, this is the, uh, the usual procedural report regarding membership of Cabinet allocation of portfolios, appointments to the Combined Authorities Committees, advisory boards and external bodies such as the Joint Transport Committee and the LEP. Um, so all of the, the proposed appointments are set out in the report um, and uh, there, as you will have seen there are a couple of um, positions to be uh, completed which will be filled in in due course. Um, two points to highlight, Chair. Um, we are suggesting that Cabinet leave the decision as to the appointment of the Chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee to that committee itself, which is what's happened in previous years. And also the report deals with the creation of the Strategic Partnership Group. Uh, this is to be an advisory board to assist the North of Tyne Combined Authority in developing and implement, implementing the investment plan in relation to the UK Shared Pro Prosperity Fund. Um, now, for the reasons set out in the report as to timing, uh, it's recommended that the um, finalisation of the terms, and reference, terms of reference and membership of that um, group is delegated to the managing director in consultation with the, the mayor. Um, so, uh, Chair, the only uh, other point that I should um, mention that isn't explicitly covered in the recommendations is that the Deputy Mayor is to be Mayor Redford. So, Chair, if, uh, unless there's any questions that members have, the, re the recommendations are as set out in the report. Thank you, John. Um, the recommendations, obviously, they're, they're, a lot of those are put forward by the constituent authorities. So, in the absence of any questions, I can't see anyone indicating. Um, let's move on. Now, I will go through these to make sure we've done everything properly, so apologies, but there are quite a lot of them. Um, so, obviously, we note the, um, the Deputy Mayor position on the appendix. Uh, do we agree all of the Cabinet for portfolios and schedules of meetings? Just, just keep nodding. Um, yeah. Uh, three, as written, overview and scrutiny committee, audit and standards and housing and land board, and inclusive economy board. Thank you. Um, delegate the um, Chair of Overview and Scrutiny as John described. That's item four, yes. Thank you. I agree the appointment of members and substitute members of the Joint Transport Committee on the Tyne and Weir subcommittees as written in item five. Thank you. Six, agree the appointment of members and substitute members for the Transport for the North and the TFN Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Agree the appointment of members to the North East Local Enterprise Partnership. Uh, appoint Robin, who I think has done uh, some sterling work, uh, to continue as Mayoral Ambassador for the VCSE sector. Thank you, Robin. And agree the creation of the Strategic Partnership Group. This is um, something new. The Shared Prosperity Fund will be administered by the North Time Combined Authority, but we want to make sure we get as much advice and input and collaboration as possible. So this is a, a Strategic Partnership Group, which we've decided uh, is the best way to carry out that remit. Uh, is that agreed? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. A more interesting item, perhaps, is the corporate plan, because this is about the work we're doing. Uh, it's the second year of our three-year corporate plan, and it follows the annual report celebrating everything we've done. Um, it's up on the wall there, with uh, lots of very happy, smiling people. 
and, and a wonderful image from the north of time under the Stars Festival. Um, I remember going along that. That was in the, uh, the quad at Newcastle University. Um, so, I mean, this brings together seven delivery themes, three cross-cutting themes, in a single cohesive plan. Everything that's in the devolution deal, uh, my manifesto, our recovery plan, and the priorities of our constituent authorities. And it's rooted in our values, everything about the way we work, how we deliver, and really the difference we're making for our residents, which is what it's all about. So I'm going to hand over to our Chief Exec, Henry Kippin, who will take us through the plan. Henry. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to stand up and do this. It's a bit more comfortable. Can everybody hear OK? Yeah. All right. So, um, so this is our corporate plan. You recognise much of the content. It is similar to last year's corporate plan, and that is very deliberate. We set out a three-year vision from Mayor and Cabinet, and then a set of delivery arrangements that would follow that. And this year's is a refresh. So a lot of the content you would have seen a version of before. Nonetheless, I think it's worth walking through what is the plan in full here? So I won't go through all of the, um, the detail. Uh, there's a lot of content in there. And we'll put it up there really just to show the breadth of work that's going on and say really a big thank you to the team collectively across the North of Tyne um, for the work that's gone on to substantiate that over the last year. And as you would uh, expect, this is underpinned by a whole load of lovely spreadsheets which help us to make sure that we're delivering against these ambitions. So um, we start off here as ever with a, a sense of why we came together in the first place uh, with political endorsement from our Mayor and Cabinet. You can see you're represented by Mayor Driscoll and Mayor Redfern. And uh, the corporate plan as a whole walks through, as you would expect, the vision, the mission, the sense of what the organisation is like right into delivery. We start off with a recap of what we had in our annual report, which you will remember um, emerged a couple of months ago, looking at the impact we've made in the last year or, or the impact to date, if you like. And there's a few of these statistics pulled up uh, on the page here, which are worth, I think, alighting on again. A, a healthy pipeline of job creation. Some of those jobs are bums on seats now, some of those are contracted jobs that will come, but really confident that we're putting investment into place as well. We'll see people into jobs quickly, uh, working in a really tough economic climate. You can see jobs saved there as a metric, but also thinking about the amount of businesses supported with advice and guidance and of course there's been great work done by our colleagues at the left and, and elsewhere across the region to support this work. Uh, there's a statistic there around courses taken up by local people which is a way of measuring progress but actually doesn't quite tell the whole story of employment skills and the skills and job match work that we're doing and have done through the pandemic. And then economic innovation really or innovation that achieves an economic and a social result that you've presided over as a cabinet. Here is an example in the form of the Green New Deal Fund, which is a really innovative way of supporting decarbonisation projects and creating new jobs as we do that. And at this point, I'm going to stop because I understand there's a couple of short videos that we're going to play which just illustrate all of that from the point of view of people at the shop. And so I'll stop for a minute and hope this to you. Maybe more confident. 
able to go out and do things like this, speak to people that I would never really speak to. Speak to. It's made me feel like I am more confident of a person. And what would your message be maybe to anyone who is in the same boat you were? Go and do it. Whatever you're thinking of doing, go and do it. It was about telling a story and dropping a star and then telling where you like to be most. So what did you come up with? My best friend. Yeah? <laughs> And what, 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 was it, what was it like to, to do this thing, this creative thing? It was fun and also nervous. And what, did, did you meet the man? Yeah. What did you think of him? He was kind and nice. It's amazing how you're able to take something that seems meaningless on the surface and able to bring meaning out of it and you're able to tell a story with which decisions can be made and patterns can be identified and studies can be carried out. So yes, yeah, so it has so many benefits. And the thing is this, in, there is no organization at the moment that doesn't have any data behind it. So either they're trying to understand their customers or their behavior of their customers or even the buying patterns of their customers, depending on what they do, depending on what services they provide. With data, they're able to understand their customers and deliver their customer services better. I think it's not only important for those people who are going to do the work with me, but also for others to remind them of the long history of migration to this island, but also for people really who come here, I think it helps to root, to find your roots and establish yourself, really discovering this most beautiful part of the landscape here in the northeast. And it's really powerful to walk together, share food together, and um, it helps you to build a belonging, really this experience in the most beautiful things of this uh, part of the world. Thank you, Stu. So I think that's my, my cue again. And, and... Hello, I'm in Bradford celebrating the launch of a new map. We're here in North Tyneside, we'll get back to the club. <laughs> so, so, great videos, we could have had hundreds more illustrating the breadth of what we do, and actually a real focus in the last year on areas like tourism, culture and creativity, which the Under the Stars Festival is a great example of across, across the whole region. So, I'm afraid back to the board of the PowerPoint slides uh, for a couple more minutes. Uh, there is a message from myself in there on behalf of the executive as a whole really, which is one of thanks for the, the work that's gone in in a really tricky year for the team more widely. We've always thought of the North of Tyne team not as the, the 60 odd people under the bricks and mortar in the Lumen, but as a wider team across the region, it always has been and that's, that's how we keep delivering together. What I wanted to pick out here were three things really. One, about continuing to deliver in a context that's changing quite quick. So over the last year we've had COVID recovery, COP26, we've had a levelling up white paper, we've got more changes to come possibly potentially in our region in terms of the way we interact with government, we're going to need to continue to adapt and do what we've done well together. We have seen a big expansion in our programmes, which I'll come to in a second when we talk about the money. Year on year we've had more things to do and that is as a result, I think as Mayor Redfern has often said, of making that decision to come together in the first place. And then accelerating delivery, which as you would expect me to say, year on year is the biggest thing really, particularly in a post-COVID context where we've experienced organisations that we're working with, have had tricky times, some delays in processes, we really need to put our foot on the pedal this year and we absolutely will as a team. So that's, that's a, a kind of brief message from the executive side of the organisation in support of the, the steer that we've had from our cabinet. And then the plan goes on to do what you'd expect. So we set out the vision which has been consistent from day one of a dynamic and more inclusive economy, being really clear about both sides of that connection, not just about economic growth, but about who experiences that growth and how important it is that we invest in inclusivity and we live and breathe that. 
And the snapshot on the right, which you won't be able to read from this distance, tells you of a region that has done really well through COVID in terms of recovery and resilience, with big challenges in terms of the fragility of the region and its economy. That, that's often been the case after recessions within our region, but we look into the future and the challenges of cost of living and the challenges of living up to net zero with quite a lot of confidence that we're starting to invest in the right places and together we can make a big difference. So the, the report as a whole, I think, follows the, the, the cabinet steer in that direction, really, which is about confidence in, in investing and doing things together. And the way that plays its way through, uh, as you'll gather from the report that John has just walked through, is in seven portfolios, which are outlined here from jobs generation and growth at the top right there, right the way through to investment and resources there, which cover the spread of responsibilities for our cabinet members, but also show something of the, the breadth of the work that we're doing. And if you're stuck in a lift for 30 seconds wondering how to describe the work that we do, we tend to talk about that in three cross-cutting themes, one around net zero transition and how we accelerate that, one around inclusive economy, as we just talked about, and the other around innovation and recovery, so doing things differently because actually the situation demands that. The benefits are there, set out in our devolution deal. We're confident that we will, um, what's the word, uh, go past those landmarks, if you like. We're, we're really confident on the basis of where we are at the moment. Nonetheless, they remain the things that we agreed in the deal and the things that we will hold ourselves to account on within our five year uh, gateway review periods. And you can see there how the specific work streams fit underneath each portfolio. That is all done, of course, with the guidance of portfolio holders, gives us a way of making sure we are both clear on the delivery, but not tying ourselves up in silos and making sure that what we do, we do together. So that's hygiene factor, really. You would expect that from a, from a, a corporate plan. Um, in terms of how we work and the guts of the organisation, I just want to alight on a couple of things here that are important to emphasise. The first is about how we work and the value set, which Cabinet were very clear about from day one. So this is about doing things together. This is about being mission driven in the lingo. So making sure that everybody who walks through the door has a purpose and knows what it is and cares about the impact of what we do. Making sure we are doing things in different ways. Again, as I said, not replicating the past, but, but adding value in the region, which is a really important principle of any combined authority. And then making sure that leadership and diversity and diversity of thought and action, people and geography is woven through everything as well, which again is a really fundamental so you'll see those set out there and hopefully the delivery plan reflects that too when you look at that spread across city, coast and country, which is after all, that, that is our geography. That means we have to be, be bespoke and build this in a way that's not like other places. I also wanted to alight briefly on the funding. So that was mentioned in one of the uh, videos you've just seen and you can see here, if I'd had in here a um, year on year analysis, you would have seen year one, an investment fund of 20 million, uh, if you look at the, the the turnover this year, if you want to call it that, that includes a bit of capital and revenue, but, but essentially we're talking about uh, just over 80 million, which is a combination of investment fund and then additional funding for uh, adult education and skills, UK SPF, skills funding, and then housing as well. So it just shows you the, the value again, to go back to that point about, um, about creating a combined authority and doing things in this way and the funding and, and powers that then we have potential to have conferred on us as a result. And you can see money out tracks largely money going in, which you would hope and expect again. Um, and the other thing to note on that lovely wheel on the bottom left, which again, you, you can probably see the colors, but not necessarily the text, that shows you there is a good spread across our portfolios. So we're taking each of them seriously and we have investment plans behind each of the portfolios that substantiate the, the, the big strategic ambitions that we have. And on the right, you can see how the expenditure ramps up in terms of uh, contract to spend into delivery and we're right in the middle of that exponential curve at the moment and the Treasury who uh, are marking our homework at the end of next year will obviously want to see that we're, we're keeping our foot on the pedal. I hope that's okay so far. Not long to go, I promise. Um, in terms of impact, we, again, as you'd imagine, we've done quite a lot of work to understand both our impact in terms of the, the specific things we're held to account on, like job numbers, GVA ad, extent of private sector leverage, but also on the things we care about more widely. So Covenant's been really clear on making a positive dent in terms of poverty reduction within the region. So we've developed a set of metrics here with portfolio holders that show how if we continue on the path that we are at the moment, we will fare between now and the end of the devolution deal period uh, against those metrics. 
So you can see those month on month stacking up again. I, I don't want to be confident and say we want to overshoot those. I think everyone would want to, and there's no reason why we can't with additional funding and resources. And then in terms of evaluation, um, we've got Anna in the room over there who's done a lot of work personally, but the organisation as a whole has thought quite carefully about how we evaluate what you do. It's often not a one-to-one -one relationship between funding and powers and what you want to change, so that the economy and the region will take more than us as collective organisations to change it, but we need to be very clear about what our impact is within, within the, the, the economy and the region that we're in. So there's a lot of detail that sits underneath that, and that's worked up with our colleagues within central government as well, uh, which is important in the light of the, the levelling up white paper too. So last but definitely not least, all of that is underpinned by a suite of delivery plans, I would say, and there's a, what we call a boilerplate for each of them. So you'll see uh, top lines on each of the portfolio, and then for, for each of them, and I'll pick on jobs, innovation, and growth because it's the first one that comes up, you will see uh, a statement of intent around what that portfolio is there to do. And we're very, very clear about that, and about why that portfolio is there, and how it adds value. We've tried to be as clear as possible about our role, making sure that we are, as I said, adding value. So we, we, we're not we're not here to um, do anything other really than push the region forward and add value to what you do as local authorities and what our business and voluntary sector community do more widely. We've been really clear about our ambitions. So they may not be big ambitions for the region in the future that, that we need to achieve through collaboration with others and not just ourselves, but we've tried to set those out on the page. And then we've talked about how we're going to measure progress and the things we would like to change as a result. And as you can see, jobs, innovation, growth, clean energy and connectivity, education, inclusion and skills, <coughs> social economy and communities, housing, land and development, culture, creative and rural, and investment and resources. I, I suppose the point to draw here is there's plenty to say against each of those portfolios, not only in terms of strategic ambition, but investment out there in the world and progress that we've seen as a result of the decisions you've, you've taken as a, as a cabinet collectively. And then finally, there is a lovely plan on the page, which I always think is an incredibly useful thing, or a complete mess, depending on how well they're designed. And this version, I think, is, stacks up reasonably well, so you can see at the bottom the context we're working in, our values and how we do what we do, what we're doing in terms of portfolios and the work streams underneath them, and then a, a notion of what success looks like at the top. So that's really how I would describe on a page what the combined authority is doing against the steer that you've given as a cabinet but we recognise what is a delivery plan that will do a lot to deliver on the goals that you've set out over the next couple of years. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, and thank you for those videos. Um, it was uh, a young lad in there who was a good judge of character. He'll go far, won't he? Uh, the corporate plan is not just our priorities, it's also our ambitions and a, a, a plan of what we're going to achieve. So with that, I'd like to invite anybody to make any questions or comments. Uh, Lucy, please. Thank you, Jamie. Um, it was a really good presentation, Henry. Thank you very much. And, and it's, um, I'm surprised Norma isn't saying this before me, but we're all so grateful when the, it's brought to life by the videos and so on. So that was great. Henry, you were kind enough to acknowledge the partnership working with the LEP and your uh, opening comments. And it's riddled all the way through the, um, the documents about the partnership working and so on. And I suppose I just wanted to say publicly um, at an open meeting how very strong that collaboration is, how the partnership working is good. And, and although you are a newer um, boy on the block um, to the left, a lot of the work, literally we built the foundations and the buildings now are going up on the foundations where we quite literally cleared land some time ago. That building on the previous work and the partnership working for the future is strong. And I think the point I really want to stress is we'll continue to be strong. We know that we're in sort of shifting sands, looking at the futurist destruction and so on, but we will keep working, uh, reaching our targets, and your targets are our targets in so many ways, in terms of investment and jobs created and uh, education and skills and so on. So it's just publicly to say that the relationships and the partnerships and the collaborations are really strong and that comes down to the the hard work of the individuals and finally i wanted to just say thank you for the last year for the support that the lep have had from your colleagues who help us particularly around um, the finance function but not only in that world but it's very much appreciated thank you 
Well, thank you very much, Lucy. I appreciate that. Uh, Robin, yeah, please. Um, thank you. Also, thanks, Henry, for taking us through that. Really, really useful. Um, a couple of supportive comments from me. First of all, it is an absolute joy to see volunteering in there as one of the metrics around the social economy. Um, as someone who used volunteering as a pathway into employment, I think the more we can do to provide those opportunities for people to find the confidence, the routine and the contacts to think about access and work, the better. And there's some brilliant stuff going on around how do we make the north of Tyne an area of excellence around volunteering. Um, secondly, really great to see the wellbeing framework referenced as someone who was involved in working alongside Carnegie and others to develop that wellbeing framework. It's really nice to see it referenced in various parts of this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And uh, you're selling yourself short. You've been a big part of that collaboration. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Um, well, it seems all the cabinet members are so um, involved in the development of the plan that they're, <laughs> they're very happy with it. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I would actually like to echo um, uh, those comments. I think um, on page six, um, 10, um, I think those forecasts are very suitably ambitious uh, and represent actually very similar kind of ambitions uh, to those that we have in Northumberland, which is um, supporting and uh, encouraging new business and supporting those people who need help the most. And it's good to see that those are very clear and reflected in these as well. Um, and, and absolutely the first rate um, uh, forecasts and first rate ambitions to have. So I look forward to the next, uh, the next period and, um, uh, and another, um, uh, another very positive and optimistic and ambitious uh, uh, update soon. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, Norman, please. I just say what I always say to be quite honest, that it's, it's just absolutely amazing what we've achieved in the short time. And to say once again, this is because we have come together and actually shared the, the, the needs within our authorities and just driven that forward. So well done. And I'm sure you know we could go, go on and do even greater things together. Yeah. Hey, hey. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, the recommendation is to acknowledge the plan, but also to endorse it, um, because that will be our delivery plan. Um, so, uh, everybody happy with that? I can see lots of nods there. Thank you. Item 7 is the equalities objectives. Equalities, as we've seen from the corporate plan item, is at the heart of everything we do at the North of Time. Yes, we are increasing prosperity, but we also want to make sure that everybody shares in that prosperity. Um, and with that, I'll hand straight over to Alex um, to take us through the Equalities Objective Report. Thank you, Chair. Um, and on behalf of Councillor Kilgawa, I must add a thank you to the team for all their hard work in making these objectives real. Um, it's easy to have organisational aspirations, much less so to make it a reality. And it makes sense that you have a diverse team here reflecting the demography of our area, um, it makes it so much more likely that you will achieve the equality targets. Um, I'm delighted to see the progress made uh, in putting people at the heart of economic development and only by focusing on equality, fairness and inclusion can we ensure that all residents have good lives, a good job, a good and high decent standard of living and to live as part of a vibrant community where cultural diversity is respected and cultural expression encouraged. Equalities is about opportunities partic for, sorry, for participation and self-determination in all things and we must play our part in changing our local economy to make this a reality. Um, I'm conscious that you will have more to do, um, not just to maintain progress, but to take steps to ensure that women, disabled people and people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds and LGBTQ plus people are the focus or are a focus for existing and new interventions, particularly to meet the ambitions by June 2025. These last few years have been a wake up call. Um, the Me Too movement shocked us all. COVID-19 
exposed the fractures running across our society and the Black Lives Matter campaign forced us to acknowledge and confront um, intractable realities. Inequality is deeply damaging to people's health, well-being and resilience. Um, it diminishes the equality and quality of our social fabric. It erodes trust and the relationship between us. We must meet these objectives to create a flourishing, productive and inclusive economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. I heartily agree. Does anybody have any questions on the Equalities uh, Update Report, the objectives? No. Um, so, um, I can see that that's been uh, noted, the progress on it. Thank you very much for that, Alex. And uh, let's move on to the next item, item eight. If I can invite our Chair of Overview and Scrutiny, Councillor Seymour, um, and uh, I'll give you a moment to... I'll keep talking while you're getting yourself comfortable. <laughs> um, but um, Overview and Scrutiny, the way it's approached, certainly the north of time, is one of, of collaboration and inviting the sharing of information and input. Um, and uh, as part of that, um, I meet with the Chair and Vice Chair of Overview and Scrutiny regularly, um, every month for a, a good long chat and, uh, and make sure that everything's going well. So with that, I'll hand over to Catherine. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, and um, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to present the Overview and Scrutiny Committee Annual Report 2021 to 2022, um, So the scrutiny of public bodies is a vital check and balance to how we spend public money. Good public scrutiny can investigate, influence, report, and recommend ways to strengthen policies, improve services, ensure best value for money, and secure long-lasting positive change for local people and it is important that we do this for our communities who are coping through the difficult times of COVID, paying their bills, and to support where they can relief in Ukraine. I must thank my committee, Councillor Linda Wright as Vice Chair and officers for their support during the year to have the most effective governance we can with a proactive and collaborative cabinet scrutiny relationship. And I'm grateful to all the combined authority cabinet members and Mayor Driscoll for giving up their time to meet with our committee. Because at every meeting of our committee this year, a cabinet member has attended to provide an update on their portfolio area of work and I thank you all and to the officers attending our meetings this year and those from our constituent local authorities and partner organisations for their work and support. We have learned about the combined authority response to COVID and recovery plans, about co-production, the Green New Deal and the Citizens' Assembly outcomes, the investment fund, budget monitoring and the budget proposals, the first full year of the devolved adult education budget and its achievements and outcomes, and the Poverty Truth Commission, to name but a few. So now we are approaching an interesting time in the life of the North of Time Combined Authority in light of the levelling up white paper and our work next year will play an important part in its evolution and next steps. And whatever structural changes or devolution deals are proposed for the region, it is our job to ensure that those would benefit all of our communities in the North of Time area. So scrutiny at a combined authority is different to the look and feel in a local authority due to its geography and strategic nature. Where it remains the same 
is effective cross-party work and engagement of senior officers and members, and to be open and transparent about what we do and why we do it. Next year, we will continue in this spirit, and I look forward to the year ahead and recommend, recommend this report to Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, you hit a, a very important note there, I think, about us being a cross-party combined authority. Given what's happening in the national news at the moment, I think we're an oasis of calm and getting on with the job, uh, because we all work together, and, uh, uh, and uh, it's all about getting stuff done. So, thank you very much. The committee's questions, whenever I've appeared in front of the committee, have been um, searching and concerned with getting the best for the people of the region. So, I think, uh, thank you very much for all your work in, in that. Um, and uh, thank you to the committee members, and I'm sure you'll pass that on on my behalf. Um, so, is Cabinet happy to um, just note the, the contents of the report? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate that. So that takes us to item nine, which is the outturn report. And for the benefit of everybody, anybody who's unfamiliar with um, corporate jargon, that's basically the accounts. Um, and I'll hand over straight over to Janice, our financial director. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, this is the um, draft outturn report for 21-22, which gives members the... Um, position, financial position, um, prior to external audit in terms of the various funds um, that we've been um, spending across the last 12 months. Um, I'll keep it brief. You, you've seen some of the, I guess, the performance type data and the, and the strategic level of the fund in terms of the corporate plan. Um, but overall, the, the, the outturn position in terms of the corporate budget is a, a relatively small um, underspend of around uh, 477,000, which will just be re reinvested um, in delivery of the investment plan um, and appropriate um, capacity to do that. We've included um, details within the report um, which shows the range of capital spend that we have in the programme. So yes, we secure a significant revenue um, budget in terms of the investment fund, but we do do deliver capital expenditure through that, um, which is set out in table four of the report. Um, in terms of the reserves, um, they're set out, set out in the report, and at this point in time, I'm not proposing any change to the level of strategic reserve. That will remain um, at around 200,000. Um, we've reassessed risk, etc., and really um, quite different to our local authority, um, constituent authorities in that. And we don't have the same levels of, of risks in terms of service delivery, so I still feel that's an appropriate level um, of reserves for the authority. Included in the paper are details of the accountable budget body, um, where we um, support the LEP, um, as Lucy has said, um, and details of the LEP outturn, um, which has previously been to the, to the LEP board as well. Um, so happy to recommend um, the report to Cabinet. Thank you very much, Janice. Um, for the benefit of anybody watching on the live stream, it is just to clarify that um, the legal position is that the North East Level Enterprise Partnership, the LEP, is we are the accountable body for, and so we have to kind of sign off the accounts, even though we don't run the LEP and aren't the LEP, um, just in case anyone was confused on that. Um, there's one observation I'd like to make, actually, and it's uh, the corporate budget, despite everything we've had to deal with, with lockdowns and, and shifts and moving to new premises and taking on so much extra work in terms of boot camps, in terms of extra brownfield housing, all these things. And we've still come in under budget on corporate spend. And I've got to say a massive thank you to Henry and to Ruth for managing the team through that because the, all of the team have stepped up and they've done this work. We've seen how well we're delivering without spending more money on the delivery. That's pretty good. And thank you very much for you, uh, to you, Janice, for um, shepherding the finances so well. Uh, with that, has anybody got any questions? Um, or should we... Uh, I think everybody's just wanting to move on. So, um, there's a load of recommendations there, but they are all to note. The outturn position, the brownfield housing, the investment fund, the adult education budget, the reserves position, the accountable body budget outturn position, 
uh, our Treasury Management Performance, the North East LEP outturn position, and the Invest North East England outturn position. We'll take all of them as one. We all noted them and are happy. Thank you very much. Um, so this takes on the pay policy statement. I did say at the start this is an AGM, so there's a lot of administrative things to do. Uh, the local authorities are required to produce a statutory pay policy. Um, and although, um, actually, the combined authority is not required to, it is good practice, so that's what we've done. And uh, this is about good work. We, a core plank of what we're delivering is good quality work, so we apply that internally, we lead by example. Since uh, adopting the pay policy statement in 2019, we are an accredited living wage employer. We've made um, strong progress on equalities. 4% uh, of our staff have disabilities, 10% are non-white, 10% are LGBT, LGBTQ+, um, and uh, over 60% of our staff are women. And um, in a time where a lot of organisations are, are struggling to recruit, we've managed to maintain and develop a very strong team. Um, and uh, our differential between the lowest and the highest paid is one of the lowest, if not the lowest, of all combined authorities. Um, so that means we're we're paying the people at the bottom of the organisation well, and we're not paying the people at the top too much. Um, so, uh, if everybody's happy with that, can we approve the payback? Unless anyone's got any questions. No. Uh, thank you. Let's approve that then. That's approved. Um, and then we'll move on to the investment fund update. Now, this is the exciting stuff. This is where we get the opportunity to um, both agree or, and inform the public about the things we're doing in terms of making a difference in the north of time. And with that, I'll hand over straight to Carl. Thank you, Matt. The head of living standards is now so severe, by next winter, five million children could be in poverty, the worst figure in 50 years. The food banks and the charities that are being forced to stand in for the welfare of the state are being asked to do the impossible. In the last few weeks, as gas and electricity bills rise, they have been appealing for duvets, blankets, and sheets. 12 parents who can't afford the heating up and are desperate for ways to keep their children warm at night. Families are faced with a choice of feeding their meters or feeding their children. That's why Cabinet is why we came together. It's why we want a devolution. We did not predict a national pandemic, a war, or a cost of living crisis. But we know what happens in this decade. We need to work together to manage it, and we're doing exactly that. The projects we recommend today build on previous commitments of 96.87 million, which are expected to create 4,586 jobs, almost half of our 30 year target, with about 819 of these jobs already being in place. We saved 773 jobs, and are heading rapidly towards saving about 2,000 jobs. We've brought forward six brownfield housing schemes, and looking at a huge 1,298 housing units, and about 20 five hectares of brownfield land. Jobs, homes, livelihoods, and family income. We're making a difference to our residents. For each challenge we face, we are responding. While energy prices remain a global challenge, we're supporting the local growth of offshore wind sector, seeing a strong demand for our Green New Deal Fund with projects that reduce carbon emissions. And we're expecting to make our first project investment as early as this summer. We all know that inflation has risen 9%, which Bank of England predicted again will rise to around 10%. So what has devolution made possible? Firstly, we're bringing forward a raft of proposals to increase family income, partly supported by skills across the cultural and creative, low carbon and digital sectors. But secondly, we're also suggesting we make further investment in jobs across sectors. Whilst we haven't yet seen the increase in employment, the latest figure for the Norfolk time fell by 1,600 between March and April of this year. We know that there are a range of reasons for this and we can't, we can't be complacent. In work poverty remains a key issue, particularly with the cost of living crisis and energy prices soaring. Urban, suburban and rural communities are all hit equally as hard. So bringing forward proposals for free employment partnerships. Some colleagues also remember approving the first two skills for growth projects at the last cabinet. We're now proposing the further six projects in one of our flagship initiatives. For 2,825 residents, and including over 300 who are unemployed or not able to look for work, getting the right skills for better jobs. Once again, we're demonstrating the benefits of devolution by connecting skills to create more jobs. 
from New Brighton North to Cyprus Productions, from Generator North East to the New Bridge Project. We're sporting jobs for an inclusive economy. Disabled people, young people, people from all backgrounds, getting the skills, opportunities and guidance they need to find independence. In September 21, we launched an Office Screen Partnership initiative. In January, we agreed nearly £3 million to add to the BBC's commitment of £25 million. As ever, we're moving fast, and an Office Screen Office will now market the region to the industry, from production service to make it quicker and easier for companies to get up and run. We're developing an Office Production Fund, investing in a number of quality and diversity of film and TV productions in the region. We'll be able to grow the film and TV sector and create the opportunity for more private sector investment. This is alongside our continued support for the culture and career sector, including support proposals for a new vision for the Discovery Museum. These investments won't have brought a diverse and vibrant way of life, will ultimately influence how the world sees the North East. We're also developing plans to share the Prosperity Fund with our 500 participants attending our consultation events, working together with our partners for a local plan to benefit all of our residents. By next winter, again, it could be 5 million children in poverty. On our part, we're determined that will not be the case. So I recommend this report to the Cabinet. Thank you very much, Carl. When you run through all of the things that we're doing, it makes the administrative part of the AGM worthwhile, doesn't it? <laughs> we'll hear the good stuff. Has anybody got any questions or comments on the report? Robin. Thanks, Councillor Johnson. Um, I guess just a word on the Shared Prosperity Fund. So having attended a few of the engagement events so far, um, you won't be surprised to hear me um, talk about how ESF funding is a crucial part of the voluntary sector's funding makeup. Um, and I appreciate the amount heading collectively in our direction for the Shared Prosperity Fund is less than what was previously available and there may be a bit of a time period where there's a real risk that existing work around supporting people into employment or closer to employment may be at risk. Um, I suppose the positive thing is we're already in conversation with um, the combined authority about understanding what's currently funded and thinking about how might we be able to support some of those organisations to be able to continue doing some great work whilst also finding new things that maybe are needed now that maybe weren't needed when ESF was first around. So I guess it's a a word of caution that I'm sure you're already aware of, but also a note of positivity in terms of people are aware of it and conversations are starting to happen about how we protect some of that vital work. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, you make some very good points there. Before I, I bring Carl back in, if he wants to respond, um, does anybody else want to speak? Carl. No, I think Robin, you have to write the CBS do some absolutely crucial work on that sector, and it's always something that we'd love to continue to support. Obviously, we're in at the early stages now, and we'll continue to work with the sector to try and support as much as we possibly can. No. I think, excuse me, listening to that, uh, you know, if you talk to most politicians, they'll say, well, are you doing this? And they probably say, well, I want to make a difference, right? I want to make things change for the better. And I think if you reflect on the last few years, and if you look forward to where we're going, I think we're doing that. Well done to everyone comes to them. Thank you. So, um, just on the, the Shared Prosperity Fund, you, you're quite right to identify it, Robin. The, the overall funding envelope is much smaller than it was, and the availability of the money comes uh, in a very uneven profile. Um, and so, nevertheless, we've got to do our best with that. Um, but it's good to hear you talk about the engagement. We've uh, spoken to around 500 different organisations or people so far in the engagement. So we really are trying to represent the people as best we can. And, uh, and everything that the, the VCSC sector does is a real pillar of achieving, not just what we're doing as, a, as the North of Time, but there's all of the things that happen in our region without anybody. Um, so that's the nature of volunteering, isn't it? It's in stepping forward. So if we have no further questions, there are some specific recommendations in there. Um, the first two are to note the progress on the investment fund, uh, the Skills for Growth, North East Screen Industries Partnership and the Discovery Museum case development projects, uh, which are noted. 
But the third one is specific decisions. So we are agreeing the allocation of 0.9 million from the investment fund to enable the delivery of the three employment partnerships that Carl spoke about in his report and uh, make the appropriate authorizations to deliver them. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, the fifth one is to um, delegate the authority to the managing director in consultation with me as the mayor and the appropriate cabinet members to submit the shared prosperity fund and multiply investment plans to government um, and they have to go off quite quickly so I really hope we agree this. Thank you. Um, that takes us to the end of... Oh yeah, and... Um, Indeed, the, um, there was a confidential item, and just for the record, do we agree the progress on that? Yeah. So that's agreed. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, so we don't need to kick anyone out. Um, so that takes us to the end of the meeting. Can I just say a big thank you to North Tyneside? Um, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to move around. There was a period when we were doing these things on Zoom, um, and it's lovely to be back here. Um, it, in one sense, it feels like the spiritual home of the Combined Authority because we started across the car park um, <laughs> on the side. So thank you to Norman Carl for hosting. Thank you to Paul and all of your team um, for being superb as always. The date and time of the next meeting is the 19th of July, 2pm, and the venue is yet to be confirmed. Um, but I, I certainly hope that we continue to move around the region. Um, yeah. So um, thank you very much, everybody.